Hello, welcome. Um, my name is Courtney. I am with North Dakota Assistive. And today we are giving a webinar on assistive technology and adaptive equipment for diverse sensory needs. Uh, joining me today, I have Jameis Warenberg from the Minnesota Star Program. Um, Jameis, I'm gonna give you a moment to quickly introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jameis Warenberg. I'm an assistive technology specialist with the Minnesota Star Program and excited to be here with you guys today to talk about uh, adaptive equipment for sensory needs. Awesome. Thanks, Jameis. Yep. So I have put a link to download the slides in uh, the chat function. Um, you can access the slides after the presentation as well. This presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube so you can see it at a later time or share it with somebody else as well. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and um, put them in the chat. And got it. Okay, uh, we are going to put those in the Q and A instead because my chat is being funny. Being funny. Okay, here we go. I think that was a setting. So I will put that link back in there so you can actually see it. Thank you for letting me know um, that the chat was doing that. Okay. Okay, so hopefully now you can see the chat. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna, um, Vanessa, thank you so much for letting me know. Thank you, awesome. So in the chat, um, there's that link. Go ahead, down the download the slides if you'd like. Um, if you have questions or anything during the webinar, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat, and I will do my best to answer those. Jameis is going to be uh, monitoring the chat for us. Um, I see two raised hands. And I'm just going to allow one of you to talk. I have a candy. Candy, do you have your hand raised? We can see the chat, but you might have to resend it. Okay. Okay, those are just accidents. Okay, thank you. Th yes, thank you. And I'm going to mute. All right, putting in the chat one more time and I'll do it again at the end. Um, yeah, great. Okay, um, so we are going to give you um, hopefully some good information about ways to support someone with a sensory processing difference. Um, this information was reviewed by an OT that we have on staff at North Dakota Assistive, but neither Jamis or I are occupational therapist. So please um, remember that this is not medical advice and that you should work with your own provider. So, okay. Um, and that very OT, uh, her name is Randon. Um, she said this quote when we were talking about the webinar um, and the quote is, the world is sensory. And I just thought that was uh, the perfect way to describe it. Our world is is made up of sensory inputs. So on the screen, there's a picture of a globe in a person's hand. Um, and I think that really encompasses it, that quote, the world is sensory. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a quick intro to what sensory processing is. Again, just a quick little disclaimer, we're not sensory professionals. Um, this information is um, not intended to be a substitute for professional uh, medical advice or treatment.
Okay. Um, so when we think of our senses, we all know about the five senses, right? We know about our sight, our smell, our taste, our hearing, and touch. But there are three other senses, sometimes even thought of as four, um, that we also have that contribute to how we get information about the world around us. Um, so those other senses are our vestibular sense, um, which is our sense of balance, um, our body position in space, um, coordination, our proprioceptive senses, and our proprioceptive sense is our movement sense. So it's telling us, um, you know, where we are, how much force to exert, um, and it helps us feel grounded. And then lastly, we have our interoceptive or internal sense. And that's kind of like our sense of what's going on within our own body. Like I am hungry or feels like my heart rate is beating quickly, that type of thing. So eight senses. Each one of these senses contributes to how we perceive the world. So my sight is one of my senses and it's giving me input. I see um, out my window, a snowbank, and that's giving me input. My brain is interpreting what I see. Um, I can smell my chapstick. I could taste it too if I wanted to. Um, and, and those are ways that I'm getting information about the world. With sensory processing disorder, um, those that information is not always being translated correctly. So I actually have a video um, from a well-renowned uh, expert in sensory processing um, to just give you a short idea, explanation of what it is when sensory processing um, is not functioning appropriately. Hey, Courtney. Yes. Um, I don't know about other people, but my screen is frozen on the intro to sensory processing slide. Have you moved forward from that? I haven't. Okay. Thank I you. just moved forward. Awesome. And there it should be a YouTube video on the screen. Yep. You're good. Cool. Okay. So I am going to play this video. It's linked. Um, and the title of the video is called What is Sensory Processing? It's from the STAR Institute, um, which is a, um, a place in uh, Colorado where they focus on sensory processing. Um, it, and they do research, they do therapies, all that side of thing. Sensory processing is how our brains and nervous systems use what we sense to make sense of the world. If it's not working for us, the world feels disorganized, threatening, unpleasant and unsafe. When sensory processing goes wrong, it can contribute to developmental delays, challenging behaviours, difficulties with social participation and attention. Disordered sensory processing can prevent us from ever feeling calm or safe. It can result in anxiety, disorganisation, difficulties with coordination and reduced participation. So for me, that video was really powerful. Um, in helping me understand just how important sensory processing is to our world and to our well being. Um, I grew up um, with a sibling with sensory processing disorder, and it was always tried to be explained to me you know, we can't go into this type of situation, it's, it's just too much. We have to choose to do a different activity, or we need to ad adapt. But even though I have all those years of experience with a sibling with that, I never quite understood just how deeply those sensory, that sensory processing um, disorder has impacted um, anxiety levels, um, ability to feel calm and safe um, is just, it really blew my mind watching this and researching for this pr presentation.
Um, so in, in kind of short, sensory processing disorder, sometimes they call it sensory integration disorder, is trouble managing information that comes through the senses. Um, another quote is that people with SPD, sensory processing disorder, misinterpret everyday sensory information, such as touch, sound, and movement. They may feel bombarded by information. They might crave intense sensory experiences, or they may be unaware of sensations that others feel. They may also have sensory motor symptoms, such as a weak body, clumsiness, awkwardness, or delayed motor skills. So with sensory processing, there can be different types of differences. A person can have hypersensitivity um, in one or more senses, and hypersensitivity is sometimes known as being sensory avoidant. Um, folks might call this person oversensitive. Some examples of someone who, of behaviors of someone who might be uh, experience hyper, experiencing hypersensitivity would be that they want to allow uh, void loud noises, bright lights, all that stimulation. They might not like tags on their clothing or textures of clothing. Um, they might strongly dislike crowded spaces, heat, um, might not like trying new foods. On the other side is hyposensitivity or those that are sensory seeking. And so these are folks that want to touch things, they want to squeeze things, they want to be tightly hugged, play rough, um, they might not know they're playing too rough, um, and they might have a very high pain tolerance. Now, a person can have both hyper and hyposensitivity in one or more senses. So they might be hypersensitive, say, to sound, but hyposensitive to proprioceptive proprioception. I'm going to take a drink. I'm thirsty already. Um, and their experiences with sensory processing disorder um, might not be as intense in all circumstances. So if they're feeling well-regulated, grounded, their routine is on, um, you know, going to a crowded place uh, for a little while might be okay for them. Um, and even if they have that um, hypersensitivity to, to sound or something, versus if they're feeling dysregulated, maybe they're tired, um, maybe the environment is, is just wonky, um, there's something going on in their life, it might be more intense. They might be having a more intense experience. So it can go from being something where it's this constant feeling of annoyance to just like complete overwhelm and shutdown. Obviously, none of us want to have overwhelm or shut down. Um, so I'm just going to give you an overview of some different assistive tech that can help with these sensory processing issues. One more disclaimer. <laughs> um, please consult with uh, an occupational therapist or behavioral specialist when you implement specific devices for a person. So one of the first things I want to talk about is uh, sensory choices. Um, so if a person is starting to experience that they feel they know they're getting to overwhelm or maybe they are at overwhelm, um, they might not always be able to express what they need. So we could have a sensory choice board of um, activities or devices, um, that we know that they, they find calming that helps them regulate. Uh, so uh, on the left side of the screen is a sensory choice board. Um, it's actually just a piece of paper and it has nine squares and there are little squares that you can Velcro to it. So you can take them on and off. So it could be your choices that are appropriate for that person. Um, and they're on that board, we have different sensory activities or devices that they might like. So they might like the brush or Play-Doh, or maybe they want to jump on a trampoline. So those are some of the different choices on that board. Um, 
And then on the right side of the screen is what's called a sensory schedule. So this might be the child's person's choice choices of what sensory activities that they think they need in that moment. And they're going to select from that sensory board maybe and put it over on their schedule. And they say, first, I want to bounce on the ball. Then I want to do jumping jacks. And then I'm going to walk. And then maybe hopefully I'll be able to um, transition back into uh, that activity that I need to be doing right now. Uh, so these are just DIY items. Um, I was at a conference actually with Jameis um, and Toby Dynavox, which is a communication device uh, manufacturer. They had a session with Easter Seals um, where we were able to create these sensory choice boards. Um, but that was an activity that's available for free for those that have a Toby Dynavox My Board Maker account. Um, you can create these all on your own. You could do it in Word. Um, you could have pictures of your own activities. Um, you could use construction paper. I just thought this was a really good example. Okay. Uh, the first sense of devices um, that I wanted to talk about is for lighting. Um, so in my research, I found that a lot of folks can be overstimulated by overhead light, specifically uh, fluorescent lights. Uh, so first thing, just if it's appropriate for the person, reduce overhead light. Um, if you're working with someone with a vision impairment who needs all the light they can get, this wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> so if it's appropriate, um, you could add a fluorescent light cover. So the picture on the top right of the screen is of an overhead fluorescent light. And on the light, it's got this transparent cover of a beautiful scene of clouds. My first experience with these fluorescent light covers was at the orthodontist as a child. You're sitting there getting your teeth drilled in and uh, at least they had these to look at. So they just magnetically attach to overhead fluorescent lights. So good option for office um, or school that type of environment. And there's so many cool designs out there. It's not just like one color. It's these clouds or galaxies or could be um, a favorite cartoon type of thing. For lighting, you want to offer uh, different sources of lighting, uh, task lighting, lamps, overhead, um, and then be aware if the person um, is sensitive to certain types of bulbs. Uh, so that might affect somebody. Uh, they might be very sensitive to any flickering. So it might be, not be something that you can sense, but that doesn't mean that they're not experiencing that. So if they say, oh my gosh, that overhead light is flickering and it's driving me bonkers, like believe them and see if you, a change can be made. And then uh, lastly with lighting, uh, I want to encourage you to think about using smart home devices, um, smart home lighting devices to create sensory environments uh, for different needs. So there are so many different types of smart home devices. Um, I did a webinar four months ago or so about smart home, um, and I'll be sure to link it on YouTube, but um, there's there's thousands, literally thousands of smart home devices now. And there are things like these pretty light strips. Um, so the picture in the bottom right is of like this cool, um, very chic kind of office um, where they have, um, it almost kind of looks like a chemical structure, uh, fluorescent light strips that are very pretty and they're calming and they're like turquoise and blue and, and orange and pink. Um, and those are from a company called Govi and they make a ton of different smart lights. Uh, there are a lot of different manufacturers for smart lights, but you can do things like those cool, um, you know, kind of artful pieces. It could be something where you just plug a uh, smart um, smart plug into the wall and then plug your lamp into it um, to make it a smart lamp. You could do um, smart light strips, overhead light switches, um, light bulbs, 
So lots of different options. There are cool ones that have like pretty colors uh, that can rotate. Um, so if, if that's a calming thing for a person, consider creating different scenes of smart home lighting solutions. Um, and a scene is basically that you're setting a scene. It's a set, basically when you initiate a scene, it will adjust all of the lights to whatever your desired, say, color, temperature, brightness um, is. And making that so it's all together and then you can access it or the person can access it very quickly um, is really a cool idea. Um, and a couple quick ways that a person can access a smart home scene or a routine are with um, shortcuts on iOS devices or action blocks on Android devices. Okay. Um, other things for visual uh, stimulation, we can think of fiber optic lights, you know, those long tubes where they're glowy and things like that, um, cool projectors. Um, you can find a bunch on Amazon in the bottom center of the screen. It is a picture of a living room where they have a galaxy type projector lighting up the whole ceiling and the walls. Um, there are lots of different ones. Um, you can do bubble tubes, um, which most folks are familiar with. There are DIY versions of things you can make like bubble tubes or glitter tubes. You could do bubbles, lava lamps, um, you could do fairy curtain lights, um, which is a different term for me, but it's basically uh, hanging Christmas lights, like um, lines of, of hanging Christmas lights that are pretty colors. Uh, mirrors are good for visual stimulation. Um, you could do like fun house mirrors. So on the right side of the screen is a little girl standing in front of it's called a convex acrylic bubble mirror um, and she's smiling and it's it's a large square mirror with nine smaller convex brown mirrors inside of it and it's reflecting at her and distorting her image. Um, so just lots of cool things out there for visual stimulation. You could do multiples, um, just whatever is appropriate. There are also apps that can help um, if you're in a place maybe um, where you don't have like your sensory bubble tubes or you don't have your your sensory lights. Um, there's some cool apps out there. A lot of ones that are free. Um, there are some that are switch accessible too. Um, one that I found that I thought was really cool was this fluid simulation app. So the left side of the screen is a screenshot of an iPad in this fluid simulation. It's very dark. And then when you touch the screen, bursts of, of colorful light come through in swirling patterns. Um, on the right side of the screen is a switch accessible app called Marsh by Sensory App House, um, which is a maker of a lot of sensory apps. Um, so this one's switch accessible. It's also very kind of easy to manipulate. It looks kind of like a digital uh, rain, purple digital rain on a background. And then there's two bars with balls on the ends, kind of like barbells. Um, and when you tap, you can change the direction of the bars. You can change the background. You can change how fast they go, that type of thing. Hey, Purple Rain, that must be a Minnesota company. <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So on the other side, sometimes we need to reduce visual stimulation, um, especially on electronic devices. So a few ways to do that are color filters. Um, so like iOS devices have a color filter built in. And you can uh, change, you can put like a pink filter on the screen and it could be very transparent or much more opaque. Um, you could change something to grayscale mode. Um, you can reduce movement on your smart devices. 
you could put your devices in dark mode, um, which inverts the colors, um, which can be a lot easier on the eyes as well. Uh, you can try out focus mode. Um, so a lot of devices now have focus modes built in where you can customize what notifications come through, um, what's coming up in the background. So there's less stimulation coming in. Uh, for monitors, you might need to get like an anti-glare filter um, that can be placed over top of the monitor. There's some very um, excellent high-end monitors now that have anti-glare, different things like that. Um, you can even reduce this refresh rate for some monitors. That might be helpful for somebody that's getting too much visual stimulation. On a iPad, um, you can get an anti-glare screen protector called the Paper Lake. Um, and they, I think, marketed this more towards artists that use an Apple Pencil, but it really gives the iPad more of a paper-like appearance, hence the name. Um, and then you could, in your browsers, try reading modes. Um, so like Safari and Chrome have reading modes built in. Um, Microsoft Edge um, has even more built into it. Uh, so they have one called Immersive Reader. Um, and so Immersive Reader is actually a learning tool. Um, and I just advanced a slide to show you a before and after of what the same article looks like once I have turned on Immersive Reader. So on the left side of the screen is this article that I accessed on Psychology Today called Sensory Processing Disorder. Um, like most things on the internet, there's there's always stuff going on on the sides, there's advertisements, there's pictures. Um, this one fortunately doesn't have like a lot of moving things like those refreshing ads that are really annoying. Um, but then on the right side of the screen, what I've done is turned on Immersive Reader um, just by going into the uh, edge uh, address bar up top. Um, it's very simple and it's free. And then I've set up some different preferences in Immersive Reader. So I have it first and foremost in a simplified reading mode, um, which what that does is it takes away the visual clutter, the excess, those moving parts that are very stimulating. Um, and it's, it's really brought that article down to just its core um, and, you can change the text size, the background color, uh, the font, that type of thing. And then I've also turned on something called line focus. And what line focus does is it um, will blur out or make opaque, really kind of put a curtain over the parts of the screen that you're not reading on. And it'll follow as you're scrolling down um, or up through an article. So um, the image on the right side is of Immersive Reader turned on and it has that uh, line focus turned on. So there's only three lines of text that are apparent that you can read. Um, the text is on a white background, black text in a sans serif font. Um, it just is a much less stimulating reading environment. Courtney, I'm going to interject here and just also yeah. talk about um, Beeline Reader, uh, which is an app or an extension that you can download that is similar to what you've described here with the Immersive Reader. The only difference is, is that it adds a little bit of a color gradient to the text so that you can kind of um, read across the text and it will go from like black to blue at the end of the sentence. And then as you transition to the next sentence, it'll be blue again. So you can kind of connect the dots and follow the color um, to make easy uh, make it easier to read a, a paragraph of, of black text. Uh, thank you, Amy. I was just going to do that. I was going to add that in there as well uh, into the chat for a little um, so you guys can take a look at it. Perfect. Thanks, Jameis. Yeah, Beeline Reader is a great, great um, extension. And it's available also as in app add-on for Safari. Um, so you can use it on an iPhone. Uh, another thing about um, 
the line focus. So if you're reading a textbook or just a printed material, um, there are lots of low tech, inexpensive filters you can put on um, printed materials so that you can have like a color filter or it can be a line focus where it's really blacking out most of the text other than those few lines you're trying to concentrate on. Um, I am moving on to smell. Um, smell is a really powerful sense um, and it's very linked to our emotions and our emotional memories. So somebody could encounter a smell that could bring up a very traumatic memory for them. Um, it's, it's just really interesting how uh, our sense of smell works and how it's tied to that emotion. Uh, just some different strategies um, to think about is if you need to have a fragrance-free environment, um, increasing airflow, opening windows, um, it might be appropriate for aromatherapy. So you could have an essential oil diffuser um, for somebody. So I just have a picture of essential oil diffuser on the screen. Uh, they make little rollers um, that kind of look like roll on perfume. You can pop it in your bag. Um, I have a little satchel of lavender that I was gifted here that I'm holding. And it's a very calming smell and it's just kind of a nice little thing. Um, so that could be something else to consider. Um, and you could also try peppermint gum is a strategy um, because it's very strong and uh, can help if you're in a, if you can't leave that type of situation. A few more strategies for smell. Um, so if you are trying to increase uh, that smell are scented things like scented markers or Play-Doh. Uh, they're scented stickers. So that's cool. Um, for safety for smell, uh, this is kind of something you don't really think about. But if someone doesn't has an under-aroused sense of smell, are they going to know? Are they going to know that there's natural gas coming in? Are they going to be able to smell that? Um, you know, it, can they smell that rotten egg? If they can't, um, maybe you want to consider a natural gas detector, which will give them a visual and auditory alert. So that's a picture I have on the screen. This one's just a plug-in. Um, it can alert you to, say, if your uh, gas stove is on or there's propane. Um, so just consider that. Uh, another thing is that our smell is something we use to tell us if if we can eat something. Um, so if if our sense of smell is under aroused and um, we might wanna think about safety. Uh, so making sure that we label things that a person uh, cannot eat. Um, you can still get Mr. Yuck stickers from the 90s. Uh, you can get a free sheet of them if you contact uh, the Pittsburgh Center. Uh, the Mr. Yuck sticker there is a clickable link. Um, you can get those, put them on, so the person has a visual uh, reminder that something's not safe. Um, another thing you could make is, say, a little cheat sheet for them uh, that is you put on the fridge or in the kitchen, somewhere like that, that tells them to remember to check the expiration date, to look for mold, to see if the item has changed its color or texture. Um, and to make sure they're checking that it doesn't have a hazard symbol or a Mr. Yuck sticker. Courtney, uh, just yes. a quick interjection here. We have a, a question. Okay. Um, but I want to make a quick statement too that the um, this slide is particularly important for um, people who maybe suffer from long COVID as well, who oh, have yes. lost a sense of smell um, because of COVID. So this can be applied to those uh, individuals as well. Um, but the question is, is what do we have for a fragrance-free environment? So want to be able to have some smelly stuff, but maybe it's a fragrance-free environment and that's always really touchy, so. Yeah, you know, these are kind of based on your individual. As far as devices, other than like an air purifier, I'm not really sure. Um, it's more about, you know, making sure that folks aren't wearing like strong scents, like strong perfumes, um, that if it's cooking, 
uh, you know, a place where there's cooking, that it's well ventilated, um, that cleaning products, you can do, try and find ones that either they have less scent, less strong scent, you know, maybe not the pine salt, but maybe there's another alternative that might not have as intense of a scent. Those are kind of some things you could think about. And I have a mother-in-law who has a chemical sensitivity, so she cannot do any type of chemical perfumes or anything with chemicals in them, but she could do more natural scents like aroma, uh, aromatherapy or essential oils um, within small doses. So okay. um, um, that might work for, for, for you, but it may not. It might trigger um, some uh, sensitivity from others as well. So just be careful of that as well. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, this is about oral motor. Um, some folks are looking for more sensation. And one way they do that is by chewing on things or eating things that um, aren't food or aren't appropriate uh, to be putting in one's mouth. So if you search on Google for um, chewlery, C-H-E-W-L-E, R-Y, I had to look down at how to sp spell that. Um, jewelry, which is chewable jewelry, you'll get a ton of different results. Uh, you know, make sure you're finding something that is non-toxic and safe to be putting in the mouth. Um, so picture on the right of the screen is these fun little uh, ice cream necklaces and all these different colors. And they've got a couple different textures on them for someone to chew on. On the left side of the screen, um, I have something called chew sticks. Um, and these actually go on top of a pencil. Um, they don't have to, you can just hold them. And they've got some different textures for someone to chew on. Um, and if someone is looking for that chewing type of thing, there's different textures, there's different hardnesses, there's different flavors um, that, that might meet that need for them. I'm going to move on to hearing. Um, so hearing is a big one. I think a lot of people are aware of some good adaptations for folks. Um, I want to remind everybody about noise canceling headphones and earphones. Um, you know, you can go to the hardware store and get noise canceling pair of over the ear headphones. Um, but there's great ones online. You can spend $400 on some Bose noise canceling headphones. You do you, you do what's right for you. Um, but that's a good option for some folks if they need less, um, or maybe they need to listen to their music more. Um, and they, you wanna make sure they have a good headphones for that so it's not escaping to distract others. Um, you could consider earplugs to reduce sounds. Um, and earplugs, because of like the rave and EDM scene, have become like a thing. It's cool. This is the um you know folks in that scene are are starting to protect their ears a lot more so they don't end up like with hearing loss like me because I used to like to stand in front of the speakers. Um so like a side bonus of that is that now there's all these really cool earplugs um and you can have them into like jewelry and there's different levels of earplugs. Um, so on the screen, kind of at the bottom, on the left, I have Loop Engage earplugs. So Loop is a company that makes earplugs, and their earplugs um, all have a little loop or like a ring on them. So you can uh, set them in your ear and easily pull them out. And there's tons of different jewelry things you can add to these. Um, uh, if you look on Etsy or places like that, you can look for earring holders for loop earplugs. You could also search for earplug earrings or earplug necklaces. Um, so lots of different things. There's some very pretty ones. Um, so at the bottom of the screen is just an example of a person that's got a loop earplug, it's gold, and it's in their ear, but it's attached to via this delicate chain to a hoop earring. It's got a little bumblebee hanging off of it. Uh, so it's kind of like a fashion thing too. Um, this particular type of loop earplugs um, are meant for somebody with a sound sensitivity. 
Um, so it's meant to reduce background noise while still allowing you to hear voices. So that's pretty cool. Um, the calmer earplugs are kind of the same type of idea. The, the calmer earplugs, which are at the top right of the screen, um, they have, they're kind of like a cone that's been squished a little bit to go into your ear, but it's hollow on the inside to allow sound to come through, but it's supposed to like shape your eardrum so you don't have so much of the background sounds. Pretty cool. Um, for hearing or auditory, um, you can create custom playlists on whatever music streaming app you might like. Um, also consider like background sounds or white noise machines and apps. Uh, you know, you got the basic white noise machine that's been around for a long time and those can work great. Um, iPhones now have iOS background sounds built in. They're free. There's like five different sounds like white noise, ocean, bright noise, dark noise, and rain, I think. And you can, those can play even while you have music playing on your iPhone. Um, you could consider an app like Noisily um, or Better Sleep. Both of those have um, basic and paid versions, um, and they allow you to create your own customized um, like background sounds. So on the right of the screen, I have the Better Sleep app, and you can have like 15 different sounds going at the same time, all at different levels. Um, so it could be brown noise combined with a river sound and um, a fireplace crackling. Um, so you can combine them, decide how much of each sound you'd like. Um, so those are uh, like, that's uh, the Better Sleep app. Noisily is another one. And Noisily is N-O-I-S-L-I. And that one's primarily a browser app, but I do believe they have smartphone versions as well. And with both of those, you can create those customized sounds and save them for later. Um, so depending on if you're trying to calm or you're trying to arouse, um, you can have different playlists. Okay, and then for touch and proprioception, um, clothing is a big deal. Um, I think most folks are aware of that. Um, consider compression clothing. So you could go like off the rack, um, sports compression wear, or like Spanx, um, if you're so inclined. Um, you could also search for compression clothing for autism. And now there's lots of different manufacturers, there's makers. Um, one couple ones that I found that were really well, well reviewed, um, cozy clothes. Um, so that's the center picture on the screen. It's just some three different color t-shirts with a white interior. They're reversible. Um, they're very soft, um, but they actually are like a double compression layer um, and they don't have tags. Um, there's another company called Calm Care. So on the right, there's a young lady in a Calm Care bodysuit that goes halfway down um, her bicep and halfway down her thigh. Um, and it's just a compression bodysuit. Could be a compression top or a bottom or both. Um, there are even like vests and jackets that can be inflated to provide compression only when needed. Uh, there's weighted clothing you can try. There's weighted jewelry. Um, if uh, clothing sensitivity is a thing, um, check that the armhole, the arm opening is wide enough um, and that it's not got any weird seams or itchiness. Um, you could also consider cooling clothing uh, if you have someone who is gets overheated and that causes an adverse sensory reaction. Um, so, you know, at places like Shields, um, you know, sportswear, they have a lot of different cooling clothing or like outdoor workers. Um, cooling clothing, those frog tog towels that you get wet, and then they have, um, they work via evaporative cooling. They're really big in like the hiking camping uh, realm, uh, but they don't actually get you wet, um, but they 
can cool you down, um, reusable type of thing. Um, and then consider shoes. So if you have somebody that's getting too much sensation when you're trying to put their shoes on, um, maybe there's some adaptive shoes that would be a better solution for them. Um, so at the bottom of the screen, I have a pretty fuchsia sneaker um, and it's got laces, but it also has a zipper that goes all the way from the ankle um, down and around uh, the, to the opposite toe. So you can zip that shoe on. They're not getting all that weird foot compression. You know how awkward that can be sometimes. Courtney, I'm just going to quickly interject too and just know, I know that there's a few other companies, bigger companies out there like Tommy Hilfiger that are yes. also um, promoting sensory friendly clothing as well as Target, Kohl's and JCPenney I'm aware of. Yes. Uh, also Nike is creating uh, step-in shoes that are really easy to get on, in and out of with slippery materials. So. Cool. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that that's just becoming part of, of, cons you know, mainstream. the everyday commerce and mainstream. I love that. Yeah. Um, also for touch, you just moving on to the next slide, thinking about small portable handheld items. I think a lot of folks are familiar with most of these things. You can try a koosh ball. Um, I have had this koosh ball since third grade. I'm not going to tell you how many years that is, um, but you could try a koosh ball. You could try a, th a therapy brush that provides some deep stimulation. Um, they're very inexpensive on Amazon. So that's the top picture on the screen. Um, it's just a little lightweight, kind of looks like a nail brush um, with, with very fine uh, brushes, bristles. Um, you can do a DNA ball. So that's the bottom of the screen. So it's a, it's a squeezable ball filled with other balls of different colors. And it's really interesting, um, but it provides a lot of stimulation. Um, there are weighted little balls that you can have. Um, so this is a weighted ball. It's actually quite heavy. Um, but just having that in your hand can provide some extra uh, proprioceptive input. Uh, so just, you know, fidget poppers, that type of thing. Um, seating is another area that can provide a lot of good input for somebody. Um, so, of course, you can do an exercise ball or like a rocking chair, rocker chair. Um, this is a cushion. It's, it's basically like a mini exercise ball disc um, that I'm holding up and it's got two sides. Um, one is fairly flat, but it's just got a little bit of, um, <laughs> sorry, a little bit of texture on it. And the other side has a lot more texture, provides a lot more input. Um, this is called a balanced disc. Um, there are really cool wobble chairs. So bottom center of the screen is called a wobble seat. They make these in all sizes um, for toddlers to adults and they move with you um, and they encourage what's called active sitting. Um, squeezy seats, um, which provide some pressure. Um, you could try floor seating. Um, and you can include like a textured floor mat. So that's what's on the top of the screen. It's these different uh, like foot, one foot cubed uh, or square tiles, each with different textures uh, like grass, um, one's smooth, one's bumpy, one looks like fur. Um, so you're getting different inputs there. You could do a, a chair fidget, um, which is basically like an exercise band that's been wrapped around at the bottom of the chair. So you can bounce your legs on that um, instead of driving everybody in your class bonkers like I did. Um, I could have had a, a chair fidget rather than shaking my whole desk. Um, so just some different ideas. There's lots of cool DIY ideas out there. I put a link to um, an article, six low cost ways to create a sensory friendly chair. Um, so check that out. And then our need for adaptive seating doesn't end when we leave school. Personally, this is my 
wobble disc. This is my balance disc. I also have a big exercise ball I sit on. Um, and I have my wobble disc at the office and I put it on my chair. And if I need a little bit more input, I, I put it on the pointy side. Um, there's also um, active seats, they're sometimes called, or active stools that allow you to lean forward without like cracking the legs of the device. They're meant to move with you. Um, or you could try a kneeling chair. Um, so bottom left picture is of a kneeling chair. It's a person sitting in it. So their pelvis is kind of at an angle pointed down uh, about 45 degrees. I think, can't remember my angles. Um, and then they're actually kind of leaning on their knees and they can rock back and forth. Um, there's different positions you can sit in in that. Um, some deep pressure items are on the next slide. So these really provide a lot for those um, folks that are sensory seeking. Um, so compression items, weighted items, um, there's like these cocoons that you can get, there's blankets, there's weighted lap pads. Um, there are weighted stuffed animals. Um, I was in Disney World not that long ago and picked up a stuffed animal and it was weighted. I thought that was so cool. So, you know, stuffed animals, um, they're becoming more mainstream. So you can have that something with a little bit more weight. Um, there are compression bed sheets that provide like a cocoon-like feeling. Uh, there's bigger items as well, like a squeeze roller. So there's a little boy um, pictured on the screen and he's going in between these squeeze rollers. So there's like two tubes on top, they're padded. And then there's a couple on the bottom and he's squeezing through them um, and getting a lot of good input. Uh, to his body as he's doing that. Um, you could try foam rollers too, exercise bands, uh, mini trampolines, these big bouncy balls um, that have handles. So on the right side of the screen, there's two kids um, and they're each on these bouncy balls that have handles. Um, super fun, good exercise and good um, deep pressure input. Um, Courtney, I just want swings. you to be aware that we have about eight minutes left. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I never go as fast as I should. <laughs> um, for sleeping, uh, another area to consider, a um, lot of the same things we talked about already, like the compression items. Um, you can do compression bed sheets where they have like little cocoons that you can get. So the center picture here is of a woman in a cocoon. Um, they call it, this company calls them sleep pods. So she is all snuggled up, um, completely encased. Her body is completely encased in this like jersey like fabric that's giving her a little squeeze. Um, you can do weighted blankets, of course, uh, essential oil diffusers for smells, um, wake up lights. Uh, if you have somebody that you need to give more stimulation to in the morning because it's hard for them to get up. Um, so those are like sunrise emulator lamps. Um, if you look for those, there's $30 options and $300 options. Uh, so that's on the top right of the screen of a picture of the Philips. Um, sunrise lamp and it's round and then it gradually brightens um, to a, a daylight glow as the alarm is going off. Um, also consider things like blackout curtains um, or eye masks. Uh, there are weighted eye masks, uh, also ones that offer scented or aromatherapy benefits. So consider an eye mask. Um, okay, so those are some items in general. Um, one other quick area I wanted to talk about is about transitioning, because um, transitioning can be exceptionally hard for folks um, with sensory processing disorders. So a few just strategies to help is to cue, uh, letting them know something's coming up. Try using a visual timer, which I clearly should have been using, um, or a visual schedule to let them know this is the sequence of events that's gonna happen right now. 
Um, so there are there's a company called Time Timer, kind of like the OG maker of visual timers. Um, they have all sorts of visual timers. Um, on the left of the screen, it, they ha their original one is about three inches, maybe three and a half inches square. It's a 60 minute timer. And then as time goes by, um, there, when you turn on the time, it'll highlight the whole thing red. And then as time goes by, that red disappears. They have different iterations of that. They have like a whiteboard where you can put, uh, write out a note or you could write out that schedule for them. Um, they also have apps. Um, so you can get a, the app for Apple Watch um, for free. There's also uh, what are called countdown timers. Um, and what these do is they give a light. So like red, the one on the left is like red light, yellow light, green light. Um, and I should say it's in reverse. So like that's called a time tracker. And you get a green light when you got lots of time left. It turns, it then goes up into the yellow. Okay, time to start thinking about like transitioning away. We got to clean up or go on to the next activity. And then when it's red, Activity's done, the timer is going to go off. Um, on the right side of the screen is another kind of option. Um, this is called a light up countdown timer. Um, and it's a cone kind of shape. The top part of it is a light that beams out. So you get 360 view. Um, and you can set for how long the timer is and then how long of a warning time they get. And then the light will change colors with that red, yellow, green. Um, the next section is about smart home and smartphone tablet slash tablet tools. Um, I think I'm just going to kind of talk about these very quickly um, so we can get to the end. Um, but again, links are in uh, the description in the uh, slides. <laughs> Couldn't think of my word. Um, so some different apps that you can consider. Uh, guided breathing apps or meditation apps like Calm or Headspace. Um, there's calming color apps and images you can try, coloring apps. Um, there's an app called ChoiceWorks, uh, which is designed for the autism community that gives folks a visual schedule. It can do um, like countdown timers for different activities can give like if then activities. So it could be um, if I'm feeling upset, then, and it'll split off and give you two arrows, then I can do this or this. And then the arrows go to pictures of activities. So then I can jump on the trampoline or go in the cocoon maybe. Um, and then if you're using some of those smartphone tools, make sure they're easy to access. Um, so the person can get to them right away when they need them. A couple ways to do that for Android, you can make an action block um, or you can create a widget. So they show up on the home screen, you can just tap. Um, so that's on the left side of the screen is a screenshot of an Android smartphone. Um, and it's got like a 30 second timer. And then next to it, it's got a picture of a cat. And if you press that, it's an action block. And then it'll play a cat video. Um, so that's one idea. On Apple devices, iOS devices, pretty similar type of thing. You can create a shortcut or, a, again, a widget um, that can go to a preferred app or tool that you're using. Smart home tools, we already talked about like creating a custom scene with lighting. You can create a routine um, that inc includes that scene, that lighting scene. So it sets all the lights exactly how we want it. And then maybe it plays a playlist, uh, that type of thing. And then again, making sure that's easy to access. Maybe they wouldn't be able to say, you know, Alexa, calm me down. Maybe they need to have an a um, smart button that they can press. Or maybe they're a communication board user. Make sure that that's programmed into their communication board. Um, 
This slide is about Alexa routines and just how to create one. Um, all of the smart assistants, so Alexa, Siri, Google, all can create uh, routines or shortcuts, they're called. Um, basically what they do is they combine a set of actions um, in the smart home. So lights or turning on the fans, whatever. And then whenever you do the trigger, so it could be pressing that button, it'll execute that entire um, routine. Okay, and we're at one o'clock, but if you wanna stay out, um, just real quickly about um, Jameis and I, we work for the Assistive Technology Act programs in our states. So I work for North Dakota Assistive, Jameis works for Minnesota Star. Um, these Assistive Technology Act programs provide so many great services that you can access and access for free. Um, one of those is that you can access our short-term loan programs. So you can try a devices uh, before you buy it or trial it with your client. Um, so you can do that by accessing our websites for short-term loans. So for North Dakota, it's nd.at number four all. Dot com. And in Minnesota, it's mn.at, the number four, all.com. Um, and we just encourage you to contact us. So for North Dakota Assistive, you can visit our website, www.ndassistive.org. Call us at 800-895-4728. Um, we do free demonstrations, we'll answer your questions, do those short-term equipment trials, help you figure out what might work for you. And Jameis? And the same wanna... for Minnesota. Um, we have our website listed as well as our lending library website and our contact information. We also do loans and demos. Um, I think it's important to note, Courtney, that we work together. Uh, yes. We're kind of a unique situation where we get to work together as two states working as one. And that's to help, um, you know, kind of our Northwest uh, residents of Minnesota, where it's really remote, be able to have access to um, technology. So we we partner with North Dakota, which is why we're partnering with this presentation today. So thank you so much, <laughs> Courtney, for putting this together. And yeah. thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, if you have any questions, we're kind of at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat or you can email me. Um, Otherwise, uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar. Courtney, um, there is a question about the certificate of attendance. You will give that yes. out to people if they request it, correct? Yes. And how would you I like will, them to do that? I will email um, certificates of attendance out to everyone who stayed the duration of the webinar. Okay. Okay. So check your email. Um, give me till next Monday, um, but it should be in there. It might show up in your junk. So. Thanks, Courtney. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you taking your time out to learn.